On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. To discover the best in events and performances, visit BlumenthalArts.org. You know, I'd come out of the arts and I'd started as an arts reporter and then I got into doing hard news. And while I was doing hard news, I started covering conflicts. And that turned out to be what I should have been doing all along. Going into war zones, putting myself in danger to get the story, to be able to take a day's events in a conflict like in Bosnia or in Iraq and put it into its historical context, get the sound, sound of explosions, the sounds of people in distress talking to them, drawing them out, and then being able to convey to people living in extraordinary safety in America what was really happening in the world. Michael Goldfarb is a journalist, author, and broadcaster who for over 30 years has written the first draft of history. A former London bureau chief of NPR, he has reported from more than 20 countries across five continents for the BBC, Newsday, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Guardian. He has spent many years covering conflicts from Northern Ireland to Bosnia to Iraq. His journalism has won the highest awards on both sides of the Atlantic, including the Overseas Press Club's Lowell Thomas Award in America and the Sony Gold Award in Britain. He is a former fellow of the Joan Shorenstein Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He is the host of the podcast, FRDH. In this episode, Michael discusses what he liked best about reporting for NPR, covering conflict overseas, his two books of history, and the need for citizenship today. Michael, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on board. We are speaking to each other from across the Atlantic. I am in Charlotte and you are in London. You have a long and storied career in journalism, which we will explore. I'd like to begin with your current work, the work that you are doing now. You have a podcast named FRDH, which is an acronym for the First Rough Draft of history. Tell us about your current work. Well, I've been doing journalism full time for 30 years, a bit more than that. And when I started it, what I wanted to do was the, the thing that I've noticed over recent years is that historical context is often left out of news reporting, partially because of limits on space, partially because Younger reporters aren't that interested in it. And what I wanted to do was stay more or less on the news and write a podcast, read it out once a week, twice a month, whatever I had time for, that would take a current event and put it in its historical context, its recent historical context, because in my career I was able to cover a lot of different stories and I learned a lot of things. And so, you know, if you watch a certain political event in America, I might be able to say, well, this is very similar to something that I saw happening in Northern Ireland in the mid-1990s when I was working for National Public Radio and covering the Northern Ireland peace process. So the idea was to put current events into a deep historical context and also just to talk about history, because history is a guide to the future, and it is very clear that nobody quite knows where we're going. Michael, you've said that history keeps happening, that it keeps happening to you, and that you want to keep telling us about it. History does keep happening. I I keep being in the middle of it. I mean, partially because it was my work. I covered the war in Iraq unembedded, so I saw that war. I covered the disintegration of Yugoslavia, both from the diplomatic side, but I did some rotations for NPR inside Bosnia when that country was going through its agony. And of course, I I covered the Northern Ireland political process throughout the whole whole time once it, it burst 
from the shadows in about 1993 till its successful completion in 1998. And then, you know, I've been alive a long time, so stuff has happened. People who hear this may not know that 40% of editorial jobs in American journalism have disappeared in the last decade. You know, that's like a lot of work. It's a big change in how we do our work. Michael, there is the news that you cover, and then the conclusions you draw from years of experience that gives your voice on your podcast a moral and even prophetic quality. I don't know if I would use the word prophetic. I like to be able to see clearly what might happen. I like to be able to think about it out loud. I saw in 2015 that Donald Trump wasn't a joke. I mean, he's a joke, right? But I could also see that there was a significant portion of the American population that would really respond to him. And so I was able to convince the BBC to send me over to do a documentary about him and the politics of paranoia. The theme was Richard Hofstadter's classic essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. He just seemed an embodiment of that. And it went out just before the primary started, when most mainstream reporters in America were still looking at him as a joke, as an impossibility. And I realized that I live overseas, so I can see the changes that have happened in American society, perhaps more clearly than people who've been living them day by day and incrementally. So I was able to say, you know, I think Trump is going to win. And then I went to Ohio in June of 2016 and came back and I said, I think the guy can win for sure. And no matter what happened in between, I didn't want to believe it any more than anybody else did. But I was right. I knew because it happened. You know, and after a while, you do begin to see patterns when you cover a story, when you're on a beat, as we say in journalism. This is my beat. NPR, my main beat, was Northern Ireland. So whenever there were the peace process became becalmed, and you'd get queries from Washington, oh, it's over, it's this, it's that. You say, no, I'll tell you, because this and this and this happened, I can see that it will still be on track and will still be okay. Or, conversely, I could say, if the British government doesn't do such and such, the IRA will withdraw its ceasefire. It was obvious to me because I covered the story almost every day. So it wasn't so much being prophetic as just knowing the patterns, discerning the patterns of events, and then being able to reasonably predict what would happen next. The commentary on your podcast consistently calls us to our higher purposes, to the better angels of our nature. Are you intentionally doing so? Well, when I started the podcast, I didn't know who would be listening. I figured my friends, and they, they are open to that kind of appeal. But, you know, when I worked for NPR, which I did, I guess, for almost 20 years, from the mid-80s to the mid-2000s, I became aware, after a while, that you know, it's a very intelligent audience. And that radio, which is different than print and certainly different than television, really does allow you to speak almost individually, tell the story individually, but also to, to speak individually to listeners. You know, and the NPR audience is a very bright audience. And so I think more people who, who speak into microphones should remember that the people listening have intelligence and can be called to the better angels of their nature. It's not intentional, I have to say, but I mean, I'm just, I just assume anyone who's found their way to my podcast is reasonably intelligent, reasonably well-read, may disagree with everything I say, but isn't going to be a troll online about it. I just assume that the people who listen to me have an intelligence and want to do better. Michael, I'd like to turn to a few moments in your life you were born in New York City and grew up in Philadelphia in the 1950s. What was your childhood like? 
I, I did a series for BBC Radio 3 about growing up in the 50s and 60s, and I came up with the idea of I was a child of victory because if you grew up in the 50s and 60s, you really were growing up in the afterglow of victory. You're, my parents' generation had fought the war and won it. The economy was expanding in a way that it never has before or since. For 25 years, the American economy expanded. The spoils of that expansion were equitably shared. People began to acquire things, whether it's a house in the suburbs, a car, whatever. They were really good times, and it filled us all with a great deal of confidence. And I try to, looking back on it now, from life in my seventh decade, you know, I think that a lot of the youth rebellion and so on came out of a sense that we could do this too. We could push for a better world in the same way that our parents had fought for it successfully. And so I always think of myself as a child of victory. And the fact that, you know, I've spent most of my adult life living in an age of reaction and diminishing sense of confidence, particularly in America, is something that, that I puzzle over a lot. And it, it just throws into relief my sense that I grew up as a child of victory. Do you think a desire for the days of victory that you were talking about helps explain the election of Donald Trump? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I was talking to, to a BBC commissioning editor about this the other day. You know, a decade ago, we were all, I say we, I shouldn't, a lot of people we're still coming to grips with the fact that the war in Iraq had turned into a disaster. The initial idea was to overthrow Saddam Hussein. That only took about two or three weeks. But then subsequently, the whole country went to hell in a handcart. And, you know, then you had Abu Ghraib and all kinds of things. The, the reality of our torture centers hit home. And then the economy began to go bad. And people were thinking, gee, you know, this is a terrible time. But then Barack Obama got elected. And in a lot of ways, this brought hope back across the board. I think that one of the interpretations of the current, the last presidential election, that Trump won because he was able to convert 100,000 voters in Wisconsin and Michigan who'd voted for Obama to vote for him. I mean, I think it's quite extraordinary, and you still think that America always has this ability to revive itself, you know, that the election of Barack Obama was a hugely optimistic thing. But this time around, it seems I'm not certain. And it's interesting, I'll just say this, that the moment I absolutely knew that Trump would win came very early in, in the primary process, when, it, I think it was the South Carolina primary, he was debating everyone, including Jeb Bush, and he turned to Jeb Bush and said, the Iraq war was a disaster. Your brother led a disaster. And it was like he had lanced a boil, because he had said something so clearly that a lot of people felt. I don't even think Barack Obama ever said the Iraq war was a disaster, because it would be an insult to the men and women who fought in that war and who died in that war, and their families. And yet, Trump was able to say this directly to the presumed front-runner for the nomination. It goes to show what a disaster Iraq has been for the American body politic, much less Iraqis. And yet, on the back of it, we elected Barack Obama, and wasn't even close. And yet, now we've turned back in this other direction, it's very, very difficult to figure out what the state of the American Union is. Turning back to key moments in your life, you attended Antioch College in Ohio. Why Antioch? Well, partially because that's where I was steered by the high school guidance counselor. 
<laughs> I'm not sure I, I've ever forgiven her. Antioch was in some ways very wonderful, and in other ways it was an extremely difficult environment. It really was the petri dish of liberalism. And we were basically experimental subjects. In some ways, my eyes were open to things I couldn't have begun to imagine, and in other ways, I was challenged and it hurt. I studied philosophy, and I suppose I could have stayed with philosophy and done a graduate degree and gone into the academy, but I realized that I just wasn't cut out for academic life. I wanted to experience the real world and engage with it. But Antioch was an extraordinary place for a nice Jewish boy from the Philadelphia suburbs to end up. Two or three weeks into my experience there, I had a, I'd had a gun drawn down on me, put in my gut. This was a friend of mine, a new friend of mine, was living with an ex-convict. It was the kind of campus where anyone in the Midwest could drop in and be taken in in a really open communal way. And in that part, it was quite wonderful, but a lot of people abused it. And my friend Lee was living with a guy, and, and she invited me around for, as you did in those days, you know, a bowl of cheap pasta and, and even cheaper gallo wine. And one of Henry's friends was there, and about 20 minutes into the meal, a combination of really strong marijuana and too quickly drunk booze, and suddenly this guy had a gun in my gut. And now my friend talked him down, everything was cool, I left. But it was the kind of experience about the anger and the hatred that, stu that existed in America, along with the hopeful political movements of the late 60s, that kind of overwhelmed me, because Antioch was open to all of it, and we lived it very intensely. After college, you became an actor, a person on stage. Yeah, well, it's funny. Uh, I did. I, I, I'd always wanted to be an actor. And I suppose at one level I was good enough to play, you know, leads in school and at college. And I went to New York and I was driving a cab. And this was in the mid-70s when the city was burning. And, you know, I went after acting work and eventually got my equity card and I played small parts leading regional theaters and it's I had given myself five years to really make a go of it and I had a couple of close calls you know on Broadway it didn't quite work out so it was enough to keep me going and going and then after five years I said no and I worked my way back towards journalism because I'd always knew that I could do journalism. You know, I'm a good writer, I'm a fast writer. And then I found my way to radio after I got to London. And there, it was, it was, it was like performing in a curious way. You know, I was re reporting the news, and I was cutting my own sound, and I was putting it all together. But each report on NPR was like daily storytelling. Even, even a 50-second news spot... You take all the information in and you write a script, but basically you're telling a story. And, you know, I used to go into the studio and I would think of someone that I was telling the story to, just like an actor would. Who is this story for? What's the story about? Oh, this Irish girlfriend I had. What's the story about Ireland? And I would think of telling her directly. So there was an element of performance, and I think that that's why I really embedded myself with radio. Do you think people see journalism as theater and journalists as actors reading a script, perhaps explaining why so many people distrust journalism today? No, I, I don't think so. I think that it's true for television, without a doubt. And it's also, you know, and, and the more that print reporters go on television, because they all want to be on television, there's an element of that. But one of the things about my end of radio, public radio, it may be an overblown and unjustified reputation, but it is trusted. And I do think that people, it's the way people take things in if you're only listening to it. There's something about taking information in only through your ears as it's being read to you that is entirely different than watching a news report where you're looking at someone who clearly has been chosen because they look good on camera. 
And doesn't matter how serious a journalist they are, you're always looking at someone and saying, oh, he's got a nice jaw, or this woman's got blonde and whatever. And you know that that's part of what goes into getting people jobs doing television journalism. When you take the visual out of things, you know, as you do at NPR, there are some attractive people at NPR, but most of us are just very ordinary looking. And I don't think people pay attention to that, no. You went to work for NPR and eventually became the NPR London Bureau Chief. What was that like at NPR? What I recall was I loved the work, and I worked a lot. In those days, the newsroom staff wasn't as big as it is today, and the foreign staff, which is excellent, wasn't anywhere near as big as it is today. And because I was in London, I, I was often on the air just repackaging stuff that the BBC had. I mean, as part of our deal, our bureau is at the BBC World Service, and NPR pays a considerable amount of money to the BBC to have access to BBC Raw Tape. And I was frequently repackaging stuff for Morning Edition in particular because they, they left holes in the program because basically it was put together the previous afternoon and the world changes in about 18 hours. So I often did that. But what I liked most about it was being on the air every day. It was broadcasting to the smartest and best and most loyal audience in America. And I just remember doing it. And I also, you know, I'd come out of the arts and I'd started as an arts reporter and then I got into doing hard news. And while I was doing hard news, I started covering conflicts. And that turned out to be what I should have been doing all along, going into war zones, putting myself in danger to get the story to be able to take a day's events in a conflict like in Bosnia or in Iraq and put it into its historical context, get the sound, sound of explosions, the sounds of people in distress talking to them, drawing them out, and then being able to convey to people living in extraordinary safety in America what was really happening in the world. What is it like reporting on war? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it is, it keeps you focused. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to go into it too deeply, to be honest with you, because then you sound like you love war or you're a glory hound or whatever. And I liked it. My wife didn't like me doing it, but she put up with it. And when I lost my job, I lost the opportunity to continue doing that. And I've always felt like part of the reason that I was put on earth was taken away from me. But then again, in today's conflicts in Syria and so on, you can't go as a freelance. If you go as a freelance, you end up like Jim Foley, uh, who was a colleague of mine when I was working for Global Post, you know, who ended up with his head being cut off. And that's, that's very difficult to put up with. In 2003, you went to Iraqi Kurdistan as a war correspondent to cover the Iraq war. You worked closely with an Iraqi interpreter named Ahmad Shakat. Who was Ahmad and what happened to him that led you to tell his story? Well, I... I got into Iraqi Kurdistan two nights before the war started. I came in through Iran, which was the only border that was open at that point into the country. And I'd gone to Kurdistan because I was going to be unembedded. If you went in in the south, you had to go in with the U.S. Army, and that presented problems for me. And I had gone to make a documentary following the overthrow of Saddam Hussein through the eyes of someone who had suffered under Saddam. There was no question that Saddam would be gone and gone quickly. But, and I also knew that the Kurds had suffered more than anyone under Saddam's regime. So I went to Kurdistan and I got in late and I needed a translator. And all, almost all the translators had been hired already. Anybody who spoke halfway decent English was hired. And I met a guy in a hotel lobby who was probably too old 
even though he was exactly my age. He looked about 10 years older than I. And I wasn't sure I wanted it. His English was good, but it was idiosyncratic. But I could see why he was still available for hire. And we started chatting, and suddenly he asked me, I was interviewing him, and suddenly he turned to me and said, do you know William Faulkner? And I couldn't resist being a wise guy, and I said, no, not personally, but I do know his work. And it turned out he was a big Faulkner fan. And we, we spent the next 10 minutes talking about Faulkner and this and that, and I realized that this was a guy who really knew English, but in a different way, but also that he was very interesting. And then he said to me, you understand that if you want to do this story, you can't just interview people, you have to understand the culture and the history of this place. He asked me that. And I said, you're absolutely right. So I hired him because he understood how I wanted to work. And we met some people, and then I, as I got to know him very quickly, I figured out that he was actually the person I should be making my documentary about because he'd been arrested several times for dissident political activity. He'd been tortured. He'd only survived because his wife's family had money and had bailed him out of prison. And he was living in Erbil in Kurdistan because he'd been told the last time he got out of prison that we'll kill you next time. And he was from Mosul, which was just 50 miles away, and that's where I wanted to go. And so I started making a program about him. And then we became friends, as you do under intense, intense circumstances. And we were the same age, as I said, but we had a lot of the same thoughts. But his life had been unbearably hard. And, you know, he was the father of eight children, and he had six grandchildren. And at that point, I didn't even have children. And... He just opened the he just opened the door to everything for me, and we became very good friends. And then, with my help, he got a job working for the Los Angeles Times after I left Iraq. And through the L.A. Times, he met General David Petraeus, who passed him along to someone on his staff, and he got money from the Americans to put out a weekly newspaper of politics and cultural debate. And he got 12 issues out, and he was shot in the back. And the bitter irony of surviving at least three bouts of imprisonment and torture under Saddam, and not even surviving five months of the freedom that America promised to bring Iraq, made me want to write the story of his life. Did Ahmad's death represent for you the death of Iraq? Exactly right. Exactly right. There were, it's hard to explain to people who were always against the war, but there was actually a moment, more than a moment, there was a half a year at least, when if the Bush administration had known what it was doing, the country might have been spared the agony it's going through. But it wasn't, and his murder in October of 2003 was the first, one of the early signs that this was not going to work at all. And of course, a lot of the pro-democracy types, the people who had stayed in Iraq and endured Saddam and welcomed his overthrow, ended up having to flee for their lives because it wasn't safe to stay. Michael, you later wrote a second book called Emancipation, how liberating Europe's Jews from the ghetto led to revolution and renaissance. What is the book about, and what motivated you to write it? Well, I was always interested in in something, in, in a very simple fact. You could write the history of Western civilization for more than a millennium without mentioning any Jews. And then from the moment of emancipation, which is which took place in the late 18th century. Jews, remember, were kept in ghettos, and it wasn't a metaphorical space. I mean, you were literally locked away at night. And during the French Revolution and then during the Napoleonic conquests, most of the ghettos in Europe were opened up. And almost overnight, from making no contribution to Western civilization, you have great artists, writers, and thinkers. I mean, People know the names, whether it's Karl Marx or Sigmund Freud or Gustav Mahler or Marcel Proust and 
painters and more musicians and more thinkers. You know, the entire field of sociology was invented by Jewish intellectuals in France and Germany. All of this happened, and I've always been fascinated to know why. So I started writing the book to answer the question for myself, and then I found that, that actually the answer has a lot to do and it, with stuff that has nothing to do with being Jewish. It has to do with being minor, a minority population that's been oppressed and suddenly given access to, be, to citizenship, to being part of the mainstream, and then a culture that's been built up out of being an oppressed minority suddenly has entry into another world, but they're not sure if they're really welcome. But once you take a step away from your own community, it's very hard to get back. You get in, into a kind of sociological no-man's land, a psychological no-man's land. And thinkers, men of talent, women of talent, they're all compelled to try and figure out just who am I, what am I? And that's what the book is about. For you, Jews becoming free meant a uh, new world. Yeah. I mean, they created a new society. I, I, I mean, the subtitle of the book is How Liberating U Europe's Jews from the Ghetto Led to Revolution and Renaissance. Because a lot of revolutionary thinking went on, Marx being only one example. And as for Renaissance, you know, one of the things I learned, because I started out I speak some French, so I was able to do the French part, but then the deeper I got into German culture. You know, if the First World War had gone slightly differently, people would look at the culture that was happening in Vienna in a much different way than we do now. But we all know that Paris, at the turn of the 20th century, was the center of the arts world, the world of culture and so on. But really... It had a twin and a rival in the German-speaking world, and that was Vienna. And from Mahler, one of his students was Schoenberg. And music is an entirely, is much more creation of Vienna. And Freud, and across the street from Freud was living Theodor Herzl, who created the idea of Zionism and then lobbied for it. And these two men changed a great deal of, of thought in the 20th century. And then in the Swiss patent office, you had Albert Einstein. Again, epoch-changing thinkers. There's not been anything like it really since Florence in the, in Siena, I suppose, in, in the four, 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Absolutely extraordinary maybe Elizabethan England at the end of the 16th century when you had scientific thinkers like Francis Bacon and you know writers like Shakespeare. Really extraordinary stuff. Do you see any corollaries between Jewish emancipation and the civil rights movement? Um, no, it's not quite the same because, of course, you know, we're... we're as we've learned in, in recently through events in Charlottesville, you know, the civil rights era had its moment, and yet many of the what we thought were settled arguments about the civil rights era turned out not to be settled at all. And in fact, if people want to read my book, you'll see that the, this is what happened with the Jews in Europe. They were granted civil rights, and then 20 years later, those rights might be taken away. It's all done by legislation, were granted civil rights by Napoleon. But it wasn't until 1871 when Bismarck united the various German lands under the Prussian banner into the, first, into the Second Reich that Jews were fully emancipated. And my book ends in 1933, in April, when the Nazis seized power and undid all of those emancipation laws and forced Jews to re-register. And, you know, within 18 months, you had the Nuremberg Grace Laws. And it's an interesting way of learning about how virtually nothing is settled in history. Michael, there is so much for us to talk about. Your work, life on the radio, moments of history you have reported on, how journalism has changed and is changing changing 
With our remaining moments, I'd like to end where we began. What are your thoughts about America right now? What are you seeing from across the way in London? Well, to me, the disintegration of, of social connection is very frightening. And also a cynicism about what it means to be a citizen. My friend Todd Gitlin, who was one of the founders of Students for a Democratic Society, put it to me really, really well. Last October, I interviewed him for the last documentary I made about Trump just before the election. And he said, people today don't know how to be citizens. They don't know the work of citizenship. And I think he meant that across the board. I think that the country has uh, the body politic, the society, is too enthralled to the various forms of media in which it is immersed. You know, in 1968, when we were out in the streets, there were very clear reasons to be there. Civil rights being one, ending the war in Vietnam was another. I mean, these were external events that we were trying to, in the case of civil rights, we were trying to advance civil rights, and in the case of the war, we were trying to end the war. When I look at, at stuff today, I mean, even in, in Charlottesville, yes, it's right to stop fascists from, you know, demonstrating in front of a statue of Robert E. Lee. You know, fair enough. But the gross economic inequalities that drive resentments and threaten the fabric of American society, you, you won't see the same kind of demonstrations about that focused with an idea of how to improve conditions. Yes, it was great to take over Zuccotti Park. Terrific. But what were the goals of the people who did that? Just to say, I'm not in favor of this economic world. You need to have thought through what the better option is. Nobody did that. It's all stuff that comes out of media. You read something on a tweet. It galvanizes you for a minute. Nothing really brings about change. And I think that that, to me, is very frightening. You know, I think that people need to be aware that citizenship can't be a simple act. It needs to be kind of a daily obligation. And that going on a march with a bunch of like-minded people and then going to a friend's house for dinner and drinking wine, going to a bar and having a beer, whatever you do, isn't enough. You need to put yourself out when things are falling apart. And I don't get the sense that that's happening. And when I look at America, I do feel an enormous sadness and fear about where this is all going. You know, I spoke earlier about Barack Obama was an example of how quickly America can regenerate itself and be hopeful. And I think we need to remember that and do the hard work of citizenship and try and regenerate and find hope. Michael Goldfarb is a journalist, author, and broadcaster. He is the host of the podcast FRDH. He has authored two books, Ahmad's War, Ahmad's Peace, Surviving Under Saddam, Dying in the New Iraq, and Emancipation, how liberating Europe's Jews from the ghetto led to revolution and renaissance. He is a graduate of Antioch College. And now, a personal word. Listening to Michael Goldfarb talk about his work as a journalist and historian, I'm reminded of countless hours listening to the reporters of NPR report from distant places from around the world. As writer Deidre Mask noted in an article in The Atlantic magazine, we can't see NPR reporters, so we have to picture them. And because they are with us in our most private moments, alone in the car, half asleep in bed, we start to think we know them. And we do think we know them. Their voices are iconic, distinct, informative, comforting, familiar. Their voices are the sounds of our better selves when we are bright, and learned and engaged in the affairs of the world. No matter the day's events, they give us hope that in a crazy world, sense and sensibility will prevail. Here are a few names 
I grew up with. Susan Stamberg, Bob Edwards, Carl Castle, Noah Adams, Robert Siegel, Scott Simon, Cokie Roberts, Bob Mondello. Each name evokes a voice, a style, a beat that is the new soundtrack of my life, of our lives, of our shared imagination. We hear their stories as they report from bureaus from foreign capitals. Eleanor Beardsley from Paris, Rob Gifford from London, Ophiaba Kist Arkton from Dakar, and of course, Sylvia Pajoli from Rome. We hear war correspondents in the thick of battle, Michael Goldfarb in Northern Ireland and Bosnia, Kelly McEvers in the midst of death and kidnapping in the Arab Spring, Tom Bowman among the fire and mortars of Helmand Province, and David Gilkey ambushed and killed by the Taliban. We admire them for the work they do, sharing what they see and hear so we might better understand, alert for the dangers and tripwires of this world, standing all along the watchtower. They keep the powers of the world honest. They are in the game, devoting themselves to reporting and storytelling and to the first drafts of history. And on a much lighter note, we love them for their wonderful, instantly recognizable names. Lourdes Garcia Navarro, Dina Temple Raston, Charlene Hunter Galt, Corva Coleman. If we had a litter of kittens, we would name them after NPR reporters. Our Persian cats would be Nita Ulabi and Soraya Sahardi Nelson. Our Bengal cat would be Lakshmi Singh and our American short hair cat would be Renee Montaigne. And of course, our favorite cat would be Yuki Noguchi. Would there be anything more fun than that? This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. We are supported by sponsors and listeners like you. Thank you to Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating their 25th year of presenting the best in the performing arts. And this is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.